So <laughs> once again, hello everyone. You know, this is technologies. <laughs> so we are fiddling with new things. <laughs> and uh, so welcome to our improvised little studio. We will have a small discussion and small uh, discussion between ourselves uh, on the issue of uh, IP rights. First of all, uh, I'd like to express my jo joy over the fact that after two very difficult years, we have this opportunity to meet again because we are here in Brussels at the Translating Forum conference itself. Uh, and also for the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that we have a, a, an opportunity to talk about this very important uh, issue. Also, I would like to thank DG Translation, European Commission, and the whole team that has been working on the Translating Europe Forum, uh, and to Jan Faber, who is running around arranging everything. Thank you very much. My name is Mirka Brezowska. I am an audiovisual translator, writer, and lyricist from Slovakia, and I'm a member of the Council of the AVTE, that is the European Federation of Audiovisual Translators. And today we want to say a few words about intellectual property rights in translation. Yes, that's right. Hello, um, my name is Jean-François Cornu. I'm a French translator work working in the audiovisual and publishing fields. Um, I'm also an audiovisual translation historian. I am a member of two French associations, ATAA and ATLF, which are the Audiovisual and Literary Translators Association. And like Mirka, I'm um, a member of the AVT Council as well. Um, yeah, so we're going to have this conversation about intellectual property rights in translation, which is a capital issue. Yeah, and we realize that this topic is extremely complex and complicated, and we won't uh, therefore be able to go into any details. But our goal is to open a broader discussion on this subject, a discussion which needs to be continued at many levels, nationally and internationally, and in cooperation with experts and policymakers. Therefore, we will try to take a look at intellectual property rights in a broader context and possibly name the biggest challenges that, translate, that translators have been facing. And what are our intellectual property rights as such, and why do we need to talk about them today? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. That's why we are here. Intellectual property rights are the rights given to persons over the creation of their minds. They usually give the creator an exclusive right over the use of his or her creation for a certain period of time. Well, this is the brief definition that we can read online. And indeed, creativity is the uh, fuel that pushes mankind ahead. And in our globalized world, new context is created and shared and communicated in new ways. It is created by people, by authors and no doubt by translators, since they help to communicate stories, ideas, uh, messages, information, uh, experiences to the audiences and readers around the world. Translators help our world communicate and most importantly, communicate in an efficient way. And in order to do that, they need to be invested in their profession and use their skills, creativity and intellectual capacity. Hence our questions how to protect the rights of authors and translators and how to create the balance between all the needs of individual players. Do translators feel fairly <laughs> rewarded for their contribution? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> that's a big question uh, because sometimes, and um, no doubt we all know this, that sometimes a translation a good translation can, can hugely contribute uh, to, to success of a specific work. Mm -hmm. The European Union has been trying to introduce well-balanced solutions and several EU directives have already addressed this issue. But the situation varies widely across Europe. And moreover, translators work in many fields. They are not a uniform group of professionals and that makes the situation even more complex. Now, what happened uh, over the past years? Uh, one of the major changes uh, 
uh, which affected uh, specifically audiovisual translation. The introduction of online streaming platforms. That is something that affected us all. And I think also it shows the way uh, that the industry will be taking in the near, near future. But not only this, uh, of course, technologies have entered the world of translators globally. Uh, they have changed all fields of translation. We can work from every corner of the world without ever meeting our client. We use all kinds of computer tools. This was, uh, there was a lot of discussion about this today uh, during the conference. Our work is ever more fragmented. We don't get to see the whole. Quite often, we only translate a part of a whole. We sign all kinds of contracts and invoices, and many aspects of our work is now virtual. So what can we do to strengthen the position of authors and translators and, at the same time, ensure sufficient mobility of their works, which the clients and producers and publishers call for? Where does the question of IP rights fit into all this? Many translators may feel that this is not a topic for them, that this thing does not concern them. And the whole topic may seem a little blurred. But so let's start with the question, what lies behind the idea of IP rights, Francois? Well, it has a, it has a history. Uh, the notion of author's rights is not an abstract concept. concept. Um, international treaties and pieces of legislation recognize translation as the production of original of an original work of the human mind, even though it is dependent on a pre-existing work. Uh, the legal notion of author's, author's rights appeared for the first time in the 18th century, when theater directors were making money out of plays whose writers never received fees beyond the money they got paid up front, uh, no matter how many times their plays were produced on stage. And over the time, throughout the 19th century, a number of authors' societies were founded by playwrights, writers, musicians. Um, first in France and in Italy, they were the two pioneering countries in that uh, respect. And at the end of the 19th century, in 1886, a convention, an international convention, was crea created to protect literary and artistic work. It was signed in Bern, in Switzerland, and has been known since as the Bern Convention. So it's a long time ago that we realized that uh, creation is something that needs, that is an asset that uh, requires and deserves protection. Uh, absolutely. It's a, it's a, a tra uh, creation and therefore translation, which is also part of creation. It is creative work. Um, basically, it's taken, it, it, it started, the, the awareness of the protection started more than two centuries ago. And um, after the Second World War, um, as many of you will know, the Universal, Universal Declaration of Human Rights was written and signed in 1948. And there is a particular article related to our topic, which is Article um, 27, which protects the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary or artistic production. And with the development of digital technologies over the last 20, 30 years, the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, or WIPO, which is a United Nations agency, um, um, established a copyright treaty, which is a special agreement under the Berne Convention, which I mentioned just before, on the protection of works and the rights of their authors in the digital environment. So, there is a legal framework, it's not completely abstract, um, and this legal framework is supposed to make the creation of authors, including translators, um, to make sure that it will not be exploited without their getting some proportionate remuneration in return. And this is an important concept also to remember, proportionate remuneration. We'll mention it later in the conversation. And even though there are treaties like the Berne Convention and European legislation on authors' rights, there are still major discrepancies, even within the Union, 
from one member state to the other. So as you can see, it's not abstract um, and it can be complex, but it's vital to our, pro to our profession. Yes, a complex topic. Uh, and at the level of individual EU countries, uh, local tradition plays an important role. And we all know that because the situation of the authors, of the translators in individual countries differs widely. The European Union is well aware of this fact uh, and also of the fact that it is necessary to acknowledge the creative contribution of authors and of translators in general. Over the past year, several directives have been adopted that respond to technological progress and changes. And the latest of them is the Directive 790 on copyright and related rights in the digital single market. Well, uh, this was adopted in 2000, 2019. And indeed, uh, the goal of this directive is to find balance between the needs of all the players that enter the single market. And it tries to strengthen the position of authors in the market since individuals usually are in a weaker position uh, uh, once they enter uh, business relationships with big players. And in that directive, there's a special article which is really important uh, for us. Yes, and that's Article 18. Uh, article 18 of the directive uh, talks about the principle of appropriate and proportionate remuneration and uh, basically says that member states shall ensure that where authors and performers license or transfer their exclusive rights for the exploitation of their works uh, they are entitled to, to receive appropriate and proportionate remuneration that's one part of uh, the article 18. What is the second part? <laughs> well, the second part, I mean, the first part of the, which uh, Mirka has just quoted, is very important because it establishes the, the, the principle. But there's a second part which says that in the implement, implement, implementation, sorry, in national law of the principle set out in what, um, in paragraph one, which Mirka has just mentioned, member states shall be free to use different mechanisms and take into account the principle of contractual freedom and a fair balance of rights and interests. And it's that wording which is a little problematic for us, uh, the free to use different mechanisms. Yes, well, because uh, the situation changes constantly and rapidly in our sector. And uh, we all can imagine that uh, rotation and dissemination of our works is much bigger than it used to be maybe even five years ago, yes. definitely it's completely different from what it was like uh, 20 years ago as uh, people who work in audiovisual uh, industry, basically as audiovisual translators, we know how everything is grow uh, growing and booming and you never know where uh, your work ends up and whether it is uh, a successful piece and even if it's a successful piece very successful piece that is uh, sold out many times to many other places uh, we if uh, the contract is not right then the translator or the author uh, basically does not uh, have any extra remuneration for the for his particip or her participation uh, on the success that's right so, like we said, uh, national legislation uh, legislations have a lot of freedom in how uh, this article is transformed into their respective legal system. And it shows, and we know, we in AFTA and in other associations and federations of translators, we know many of our colleagues across Europe feel that uh, their position actually has not been strengthened yet, hopefully. But in some countries, uh, the situation is slightly better, or maybe much better, <laughs> Jean-François. <laughs> so what well, is your experience? Uh, how is it in France? Well, I don't know. It, it Maybe it has to do with the fact that France was one of the pioneering countries in establishing the, the, uh, the author's rights in the 18th century. But I would say that at the moment it works well, but it's not perfect. Um, and we have to distinguish here between the audiovisual translation and tra translation for the publishing sector, because we, we're dealing with both uh, sectors here in this conversation. 
translators working in the French publishing sector commonly sign a contract with the publisher uh, when agreeing to translate a book or, or a text which will be published. This contract defines a number of obligations on both parts, including the things like the delivery date, um, the amount of the agreed fees for the translator and the percentage of the proportionate remuneration the translator is supposed to get from the exploitation of the translated work. This is how it works. Um, it's important to highlight the fact that translators need to negotiate the terms of their contract because often, uh, especially newcomers to the field, think that uh, the publisher will send them a contract, which is a good thing, but that the the contract is on the publisher's terms and that's it. You, you can't, it's like a, a take it or leave it situation, which it is not. In the audiovisual translation field in France, contracts are practically non-existent. Translators and clients agree in writing to subtitle, dub, or voiceover and audiovisual production, or translate a screenplay. Um, but this agreement usually takes the form of a simple email or the acceptance of a quote. Okay. And this is how translators know that their translation will be exploited in the theatrical release of films, on TV, uh, for DVD and VOD, and on streaming platforms. So, um, in the audiovisual sector, translators get paid when they de deliver the, their translation, but in France and in a number of other countries in Europe, they also get royalties, uh, which come from the collection of the publishing or the distri distribution of their works. Uh, just like the authors uh, of the original works, writers, screenwriters, and directors. Such royalties are collected for authors and translators by what we call collective management organizations, or CMOs. So this, this is broadly the situation in France, Mirka, but it varies a lot from one country to, to the other. Yes, uh, exactly, and this is... Uh... This is our problem that it varies so much. So it is very difficult even for us uh, who work in the field and do uh, the same type of work in individual countries. When we meet, we realize how how different uh, each tradition is in each of our countries. Uh, and we even we even have to explain to each other how it exactly. Works. That's why we said at the very beginning that this is a complex topic and needs more time and a lot of discussion, and that's why this uh, our presentation will be just a brief overview. Uh, yes. So basically, in France, what you I think mostly have is both primary rights and secondary rights, and and for those of you who are not. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you know the concept. For those of uh, you who do not understand the concept, is uh, basically what primary rights mean is that uh, you get some royalties, some form of remuneration uh, for every single use of your work. Secondary rights are those that uh, you basically get uh, when there is uh, some resale of your work and uh, or further use of uh, the work that was uh, created uh, uh, for, for example, for uh, the translators, of, uh, literally translations, uh, this might be public lending uh, for audiovisual translators, this might be uh, retransmission. Uh, and in some countries, uh, translators are not entitled to anything. So if they sign a buyout contract where they basically uh, provide license for every single use of the uh, uh, of their work for indefinite period of time. It means that uh, they are going. Uh, sorry, <laughs> somebody is coming in. Uh, it means that uh, they are not entitled to any remuneration at all. So we are here in Europe, we live in, this, in, in the same place and the situation differs so widely. And this is a question, why? So we are trying to do surveys and we are trying to find out more about the uh, situation of our colleagues in individual countries. And by we, I mean 
all the organizations, international organizations like AVTE, like uh, FIT, uh, International Federation of Translators, like SEATL, which is a European Council of uh, Literally Translators Associations, because we need da data and we need to find something that would uh, work in most of the countries uh, and which would be applicable in national legislations. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, the situation harmonizes a bit for the translators who work in individual countries. So, uh, and we've we've yeah. had uh, one of these surveys done very recently and made public only a few days ago, by the way. Oh yeah, yeah, it was in uh, at a conference in Berlin uh, where we presented as AVTE uh, uh, the results uh, of our survey, uh, which was performed uh, in cooperation uh, with uh, Christian Nikolic, who is a uh, academic and researcher and translator himself, so he knows mm -hmm. the situations. Uh, the results are very fresh. And for example, what we found out from the, from the respondents uh, of our survey uh, was that only something like 16% of them sign proper contracts, proper author's rights contracts. That means that the contract states uh, the type of license they uh, they 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 give and and that the, they have all the uh, information needed uh, for a proper contract. So uh, sixteen percent is not much, mm, I think. So that's why we decided to share this piece of information with you. And we also had another question there, and the question was, what is the percentage of people who are familiar with author's rights concept? And surprisingly, there is about 13% of people who, who said that they have no idea what that is. So there's something to think about because uh, we should be aware of, uh, of author's rights and uh, of our own situation. Jean-François, is this the fact uh, about other fields of translation or is it only our problem in audiovisual translation? Well, I think it is specific to the audiovisual sector. And, and, and uh, as you said, it's right that we can now start talking more publicly about the issue because it's a very serious one. Um, in the publishing sector, the situation is actually the opposite. Um, in 2020, the, um, the, the, the council Mirka mentioned just before, CETL, our sister organization for literary literary translators, took a survey on working conditions. It was available in 24 languages and almost 3,000 translators replied, which is a big sample. Um, the results were published earlier this year and they showed that an average 70% of translators sign a contract, either always or most of the time. So that's an average 70%, which is uh, more than the opposite uh, proportion to audiovisual translators um, and proper contracts which are in accordance with the legislation of their country. As to the um, question about whether uh, translators, literary translators are aware of the concept, the very concept of author's rights, um, there was no question about this because it, 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 they assumed the the questionnaire assumed that they knew, which yeah. which is a fact. I mean, in in the, in the publishing sector, usually people are completely aware of the the concept of authors' rights. Um, however, the the period during which rights are ceded by translators to publishers vary from a limited number of years to until the work is in the public domain. So the situation is very different from one country to the other yeah. in that respect. Yeah. Um, but an average of 30% of translators um, they declared that they cede rights to unlimited or almost unlimited, unlimited time, which is a third, it's a big proportion, because this amounts to a total buyout. Uh, the, the notion of buyout was um, uh, broached by Mirka just a minute ago. And it is very important to know what it is and to address because it is widely used in the audiovisual sector more than in publishing um, and in quite a large number of countries in, in the European Union. In short, it means that translators get paid once 
once and for all when they deliver, deliver their work. Uh, the client, whether it's a publisher or an audiovisual entity, can exploit the work as often as they want and earn money from it without the translators getting any royalty or proportionate remuneration. And as a French translator, um, I, I'm protected from that in the audiovisual and publishing sector. But because I also work in the publishing sector for a company uh, or a publisher based outside France, um, uh, with a different system, um, I don't. I basically sign a buyout contract. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, the, the, that company is based in Germany. I shouldn't mention. <laughs> um, and this is a situation which is very common in other creative sectors as well, especially in music, um, especially when the distributors distributors are American companies who think they can impose. US law upon us. Um, only two days ago, we both participate, participated in a, a roundtable discussion on buyout contracts in the music industry with film composers, um, representatives of, of uh, CMOs, collective management organizations, and MEPs. And that discussion was um, organized to alert on the seriousness of the situation. And basically, it's taking us back to the 18th century, which I mentioned earlier. Another aspect which is important in, in contracts, especially in publishing, is the, the notion of exploitation reports. Um, because um, the, this is not an obligation on the part of, of publishers to inform translators and writers in general about the exploitation of the rights that they ceded, basically how many copies of a book were sent, okay. uh, were sold. Sorry, I see. Okay, um, mm -hmm. they, this, and uh, you're supposed to get a, a proportionate remuneration. Usually, it's one percent, sometimes two. It's not much, but if a book is successful, then it can it can amount to a certain amount of money, which is interesting as a complement to the original fee you got when you delivered the translation. Yeah. And um, CETL organized another study um, last year, um, which showed that book translators usually never, uh, sorry, never get such reports, exploitation reports in 12 EU countries. So that's almost half of the countries in the union where they don't get any such explo exploitation reports. So they don't know how many books were sent, uh, were sold. Same mistake again. <laughs> um, another aspect which is uh, important, especially in the publishing sector, but not only, is the fact that contracts should specify that the name of the translator should appear possibly on the cover, at least on the title page, and at the minimum somewhere in the book. In the audiovisual sector, translators' names must appear in the credits of the uh, translated film, it's usually at the end of a, or of an episode from a series. And mentioning the translator's name is important because it is the recognition that translation is creative work. Um, another very, very, very serious issue which we are confronted with at the moment is machine translation. Um, not not only with because it impacts our working conditions and, and fees. And there's a lot of talk about that today. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and even conference. as we speak, uh, yes. there's another online presentation about um, artificial intelligence, which is definitely art artificial, but not always intelligent, I must say. Um, but using human translation to feed machine is a breach of author's rights. Um, so it's it's wrong. It's basically wrong. And this so to 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 sum up um, to some extent, there is still a lot of a, a lot for us to do to enforce the rights of translators as creative writers, workers, and to work towards harmonisation throughout the European Union. And there are many ways we can fight for this. On there, yeah, yeah. Uh, like we said, again, a complex topic and. Uh, 
it is not easy and we understand that it is not easy to find a balance between the needs of individual players. So uh, even with technologies, with everything that's going on, we need to find a balance so that uh, the new ways and new approaches uh, do not completely omit uh, the traditions that we have and uh, also do not omit people who stand behind uh, translation or any other creation. That's right. And balance means fairness in terms of yes. play, in terms of proper working conditions yeah. and, and the respect of others' rights. Yeah. So uh, all the associations and organizations uh, uh, of the translators have some recommendations uh, on this because they all uh, have been facing a similar situation and uh, people across Europe are facing a similar situation. Right. Uh, so we have, like we said, we have uh, AVTE, uh, Audiovisual Translators Europe, FIT, FIT Mundus and FIT Europe, uh, and Seattle. And the national associations, and of, of course. And of course, national yes. uh, associations. Uh, so what are the recommendations uh, at this point? First of all, get organized. <laughs> this is what everybody says. Yeah, that's crucial. In most, yeah, that's uh, crucial in most countries. Also, uh, get in touch uh, with your CMO uh, in your country. That means uh, collective management organization. Be informed. Uh, because in some, some countries there are good practices. In other countries, uh, professionals barely know that uh, they can get some royalty payments. It differs and we cannot go into detail, but we know from our own um, practice and experience that the situation is not a uniform in all the countries. Yes, what next? Well, if you, if you do get a contract, read it. Don't sign it without reading it because it's likely, it, it may be perfect and you can sign, sign it with, uh, you know, blindfolded, but it's much better to read it first. Um, because you have to understand what is at stake and what a, what the how the proposed terms of the contract can affect your IP rights. Um, our national associations are there to help with this, um, and there is a trend, a growing trend towards asking people to surrender their copyright and even sometimes their moral right. And the moral right implies that. Uh, well, in, in theory, you're not supposed you even if you want to, you, you're not supposed to, yeah, yeah. to give up your moral right. But the moral right means that um, no one can interfere with your work without your um, permission. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, in the publisher sector, uh, make sure you get uh, exploitation reports. This is um, another. Um, recommendation by literary translators associations mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, or at least try to enter some nego uh, negotiations try to uh, make your voice heard that something like this exists because like we said different situations in uh, all the uh, all the uh, in many countries so it's uh, um, and we realize that it is not easy for uh, some of the members to, to ask for some something like that, yes. some, uh, some members of associations of translators. Uh, we also need some deeper discussion on commercialization of translation data. That's what uh, Jean-François was talking about now when we talk about AI. Uh, they use a lot of uh, translations that, uh, that were created That's by right. translators yeah. and there should be some uh, norms, how, 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 how this is, how, uh, how, how this is used. What else, Jean-François? Well, there's, there's, we must um, admit that there, there has been huge progress in the, in the last few years um, in the European legislation uh, concerning freelancers and, and not just in our sector, uh, because there is a growing recognition of what is called collective bargaining, which means negotiating uh, as a group with uh, another group, the publishers, broadcasters, the, our clients, uh, language service providers, which we are often in touch with uh, in the in the in the audiovisual sectors, or translation agencies in other forms of translation. 
Um, and to until recently, we were not because we we are freelancers. We are, we were considered as self-employed, equal but businesses, even if we, if we were one-person business. And as such, we were not uh, allowed to enter collective bargaining. But there is a growing re uh, recognition because there's a, there was a recommendation yeah. uh, lately, uh, recently, by the EU, and uh, th this is a very important step. Uh, we need to, and we are doing this right now at the moment uh, on our part in Brussels, while we are in Brussels this week, to enter and to maintain active communication with the European institution, the Commission and the, and the Parliament. Yeah, and there is one thing that uh, we think might help us all, and we are going to present it now because mm -hmm. <laughs> we have already presented it uh, several times, so uh, maybe somebody will think that uh, this is a good idea. We think that uh, because the situation of our culture sector and translators belong uh, uh, to that sector uh, as well, uh, is uh, the situation is uh, so complex and so complicated and there are so many freelancers working in the sector and uh, there are and like we said, uh, there are so many differences between individual countries and the situation of uh, freelancers in those countries. We think that Europe would really uh, could use something like an ombudsman for culture sector, for culture freelancers. Mm. So, well, what, what is an ombudsman uh, okay. specifically? Yeah, well, uh, this is uh, uh, what we, we call it because we like the idea somebody to somebody who would protect who would speak on our behalf because it is very difficult for us who are very fragmented in in our own countries and sometimes there is not a huge amount of members to a small association so uh, uh, there's uh, not enough energy to fight for every little thing so we need uh, a coordinator somebody who would uh, get the ideas uh, from us and maybe speak on our behalf mm -hmm. at, the, at the highest levels. So but we, without someone who would not have a, a particular stake himself or herself. No, uh, no. Would be yeah. both independent but speaking on our behalf. Yeah, yeah. And, and that person could uh, speak on our behalf uh, uh, when we speak about uh, collective uh, bargaining mm -hmm. uh, and other legislation, when uh, we need to advocate for stronger protection of uh, intellectual property rights, for example. And also, which is very important, there is a lot of talk about the status of the artist at the European level. For decades, this discussion is already going on. And again, the situation is so fragmented in our individual countries that we would really need somebody to coordinate all these efforts. We think that this might be a good idea. So, I think that we said it all, Jean-François. Yes, I what think we, we did. Said. I mean, uh, we, and... <laughs> we can see the questions already on the in the chat. But um, the the a key word in 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 this in in this on this topic and in our European situation is harmonisation. We need to um, do something, put pressure on on maybe both the Parliament and the Commission, but probably specifically on the Commission um, to. Um, so that it can um, in, um, lead member states to harmonize so that the, we don't have discrepancies where writers, creative workers in one country get the full protection and others don't at all. Right, that's uh, the most important thing. And at this point, we would like to say thank you for, <laughs> yes. for, for the fact Big that you thanks. listened to us and yes. i think that uh, we have some time for some questions yes, which are so small that yes. i can't see them <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will get to questions but perhaps uh, yes. before i will share with you just a link to a slido and if you wish please just share like uh, your your feedback on the on the presentation i thank you both uh me myself being a lawyer it was quite interesting for me as well to refresh the knowledge so uh, quite interesting it's nice and to hear <laughs> and also to see where 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 it uh, well all the progress that this uh, topic um, has uh, experienced in the meantime uh, so we'll get a couple of questions
questions. Uh, well, I'll start from the beginning, but I think you fairly actually uh, answered uh, Gianluca's question. What can one do to protect their intellectual rights? I mean, you went quite exhaustive into like suggestions and things like this. So if you feel to add something concretely to this or... Um... Well, again, it's uh, the, the situation our problem is that the situation is so individual. So it is always one person uh, fighting or dealing with his or her own problems uh, in, on a specific project. So that's where harmonization comes in. If there is some basic rule that could be applicable in all those countries, it would be easier uh, for any of us to, to reach the, the, the minimum that is that, that would be guaranteed. That's uh, that's the idea. And also, I think it uh, it might be easier for the big players or those who uh, uh, who need to obtain our rights and who want to uh, uh, to uh, to be flexible in what they do with their works. It might be easy even for them because then the structure would be understandable. Yeah. We think and transparent and transparent, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So that's as far as we can go with uh, this uh, question. One, maybe, okay, as I'm a lawyer, I'm, well, when I studied, at least we had this whole dilemma. Sometimes you're like offered something you're supposed to sign and you don't like something, but they don't give you a choice. You know, they, there is no discussion. Either you take it right. and sign it. So would you suggest to somebody like, you know, translator to just uh, actually to get into confrontation, uh, you know, before and not even sign or whatever, or just to sign and then later, explain, listen, I didn't have a choice, and then try to figure it out. I mean, well, at least in I, our system, this can be taken as a as a valid argumentation that, you know, you the weaker uh, party, you know, didn't have actually a choice. So these kind of clauses would not uh, be taken into consideration. Which is why uh, getting orga organized is crucial. For example, the uh, the French Literary, Associ Literary Translators Association has uh, um, um, a lawyer, a legal advisor, and um, if you're not too sure, but uh, it's happened to me a couple of times, I wasn't too sure about the contract, and it's also a matter of awareness. When I began, and then until I must admit fairly recently, and I've been in the trade for more than 35 years now, um, I didn't realize the importance of contracts and the fact that it was not a one-way thing that it should be negotiated. You're right, Matei, when you say when you're on your own in front of a big publisher or, you know, especially when they're big companies and they have an, an army of legal advisors, there's not much you can do to change a clause to make it more favorable to yourself. But if you're a member of, a, of an association, of a professional organization, which can help you um, look at the contract and say, ah, oh, mm -mm, this, this clause is not even legal or this is legal but it could be detrimental to you <clears throat> then you you have someone behind you that will help you negotiate and this okay. is why it's crucial but so my don't question is would you, suggest, would you suggest to start doing this like in advance you know to risk or just say okay i sign it but you know i'm not happy and then later in, come back to that uh, in what would well, you the minute you receive the contract from the publisher or from whoever you get a contract from uh, read it carefully. If you're not sure of anything or if the legal jargon is unclear, uh, go to someone to, 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 and not just any lawyer. I mean, I mean, I know that lawyers are competent in a lot of fields, but if you go to someone who, uh, who is used to, uh, author's rights and legal matters in that respect, then you'll have a proper advice. And then you can decide whether you sign it or you refrain from it or you try and negotiate the clause. Also, okay, if I may have... add something uh, to this, because uh, yes, in many countries, this is very difficult to say, I want to sign this contract. Actually, it is difficult for everyone everywhere, because uh, of course you realize that you may not get a job and you need a job. So uh, we can't just say go and fight because it's not easy for everybody. And, and we all realize mm. that that uh, the situation differs. That's where uh, collective bargaining steps in. And that's why it is so important. And I think that this is, this is also the reason why there's so much talk about it now at a uh, European level, because also during COVID and uh, during mm, uh, the technology revolution that we are uh, going through at this moment, 
more and more people work from home. There's all kinds of types of work, teleworking. Now we have a Zoom call <laughs> and we sit in different countries. So the situation of these individual players, uh, people who used to go somewhere to work and now they are freelancing, it, it changes. So, so I hope that uh, this uh, issue of collective bargaining or of uh, of the transformation of the system or, or, or protection of uh, freelancers, this uh, might start changing and hopefully for better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a couple more questions. I will start with uh, Marietta's question, quite interesting. Should we accept offers for work projects from clients that are in countries outside of the European Union, for instance, India? How do we negotiate the rates, the pay rates with those clients and who is protecting the intellectual rights in those cases? Yeah, it's a tough question. I'd seen it from the corner of my eye actually during the <laughs> conversation. And uh, I thought, uh, yes, it would be interesting to raise the, the, the issue. It's a very tricky question uh, because um, in a contract, you have two parts. Uh, usually, if they're, in, if they're in the same country, they're under the same legal system if you're working for a, com um, a company that's in the us or in india in that case uh, but you're working from europe what what is the prevailing legal uh, system and i i'm not a lawyer uh, so i'm not sure how i would tend to feel that if someone comes to me and asks me to 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 do some work for them they would have to comply by the legal system I'm under and not theirs, but it's it's a tricky question. So and another, it's another way, another reason why you must get legal advice from uh, the proper people in, in the first place and possibly an organization if one exists in your country. And if there isn't one, then if you know that you are a few people, uh, translators working in, 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 in your country without any association well try and get in touch with each other and set up one and then contact us as federation european federation we can help to help you start one up also this uh, very good question um, is something that we all have been aims at something that we all have been dealing with and it uh, it is linked to something that i uh, said before the world has changed and the individuals are too weak and we cannot help we cannot fight or we cannot uh, do anything about it if we are just individuals we need we need help we are here in europe the european union has certain uh, regulations there's a certain ethics behind so we need uh, help at that level, because yes. as individuals, we, we cannot change this, uh, it's, it's impossible. And I think that's why we need these talks at this moment, because, because now we are in a situation, five years ago, the situation was uh, different. So now we need to respond to, to, to the new trends, because how can we help ourselves if, if there is no framework? And we understand mm -hmm. that. That's why we are talking about these uh, topics at this moment. Um, maybe you, you want to take some uh, question from the audience directly if there's somebody and I will check some more yes. questions yes, from go ahead. I, I mean, can't see anything wants. in chat <laughs> because it's, it's too so small, small. <laughs> um, okay uh, generally uh, is, is there an article somewhere that stipulates something like no work for publication may be performed without a prior signed contract? Um, I don't. Uh, that's uh, that's, uh, that's yeah. difficult. I'd, uh, we need. We would need uh, more information. But uh, basically, if if there is a contract and something is stipulated in the contract, I think the, the contract should be followed. So it depends on how the first contract was signed uh, at least this is how i would uh, um respond to mm. to this question i think if 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 there is a creation of any kind then uh 
it shouldn't be made public or used without uh, the permission and co consent of the author, whether it is for free or for money, but it doesn't mm -hmm. matter, but yeah. uh, the consent of author or should mm -hmm. be there, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Well, uh, to, to, to clarify a bit more, uh, the this was Alexandra question, and she then precised that in, um, in the vast majority of cases, I work following simple requests and agreement by email. I'm aware that's not good, but I'm unsure how to encourage clients to sign a contract with me. Uh, my copyright question, I'm in Germany and work mainly with German publishers. So, uh, I mean, I might add that, you know, also agreement by email is, uh, is an agreement. So, but probably, um, um, yeah, I mean, something, some, some kind of a general reference would help to say, okay, uh, this work will be done respecting the rules of, I don't know, of, uh, well, this is copyright. a typical example. I mean, I mentioned earlier the, my dealings with the German publisher as well. Um, we, Germany is a major country in the European Union, and yet it is still possible, unfortunately, to get contracts like this in publishing. Um, and it, it doesn't seem to comply with the with the both the Berne Convention and with the um, EU legislation, I think. But again, this is a tricky subject for us because we want to advocate for it, uh, but we're not lawyers. <laughs> but lawyers won't start by themselves to talk about it, so we have to start somewhere. <laughs> right. Okay, quite interesting question. I'll just at the end from Anais. Uh, do you believe translators will be paid per hour in the future? And could this be combined with author's rights brackets paid in accordance to the sales? Huh. Per, the, per hour of their work is, I, I, I don't know whether this is uh, how the question, uh, yeah, I suppose this you. is how it, uh, how it's meant. Uh, to me, uh, frankly speaking, I don't care about the structure of how I am paid. The most important thing is whether it is decent work and decent conditions. And uh, for, uh, since I'm in audiovisual business, uh, there are all kinds of systems how, how, how your, uh, your work can be rewarded, paid, uh, even in my own country. But that's not important. The, the most important thing is whether can you make decent living out of what you do? Uh, do you have to work uh, 24 hours a day in order to, uh, because because the, the schedules are, sh are too short? And is this something that you can, you will be able to do in 10 years time? Mm -hmm. Will you earn enough money to, to have decent living in 10 years time as mm -hmm. well? Because then you will be maybe too exhausted <laughs> because there's too much stress, too much work. These are the questions. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what happens. Uh, I think that uh, if we reach a moment where, uh, or the situation, when we hit the bottom, that this uh, work is not attractive enough or maybe not rewarded enough, then uh, it will lose, it will start losing people and that's yeah. Yeah. Uh, not what we want because uh, it is uh, hugely needed mm -hmm. and translators are needed the the, the thing with the, the way we are paid uh, in the best of cases with money when you deliver the, the translation and then royalties on the exploitation of the translation um, is is crucial because the the royalties make up for the time you may have spent uh, a lot of hours you know you, we, in a very tight schedule also it's supposed to it helps cover the costs of the equipment uh, i mean the, this is what the the film composers were saying two days ago in the discussion we mentioned earlier and it's exactly that it's not just uh, um, you know extra money or pocket money that will you would get afterwards uh, from the exploitation, it's proper money rewarding your work. Um, and as to whether we should be paid by the hour or by the line or by the word or by the, the subtitle or by the minute of film, as long as the rate is decent, like yeah. Mirka was saying, it's fine. Um, but we need both um, aspects of the remuneration. 
Yeah, and like uh, uh, which was always uh, also said uh, during the discussion two days ago, that uh, you can have all kinds of contracts. It's not all uh, that per se one type of a, uh, of a contract is bad, or this one is uh, is good, and this one is bad. It's about the con uh, the, the, the content, the, the the intent. What's in the contract? Does it meet your requirements? Does it mm -hmm. th does it cover? What do you need and what do you deserve to, to, to get? That's that's a question. That's right. Well, one question I'm just from the out of my head now. Does your association like uh, provide any kind of tight close uh, contract that you would come with that kind of contract to you know to to um, to your you know like the one we are working with, not this the other way around? Do you also? Yeah. Or well, some some do and more in the publishing sector, I think. Uh, for example, CEATL, which is the Federation of Translators, Literary Translators Associations. Um, I don't know if they do, but each national associations can, uh, association can do that. For example, the the French Literary Translators Association has um, a sort of model. It's not uh, which can be adapted according to the to the work that you are supposed to deliver the, the, to the client, but there are clauses that should be there, um, and it's 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 a great help. Yes, and uh, um, in some countries there is some uh, some sort of um, uh, collective bargaining existing even now, uh, also in translating sector, uh, not. There are not many of them, but there are some. And in those countries, they do have something like sample clauses. And usually the situation is better, uh, even for translators or for authors in general, in those countries, because there is some sort of existing framework within uh, which all the players uh, on the market exist. But uh, this is not the case in all of the countries. Unfortunately, again, harmonization, at least some harmonization <laughs> is uh, the key, key word here. Okay, maybe just the last question out of chat. If somebody wants to like uh, turn on his camera and ask questions live, please do so. Um, otherwise, I'm just gonna read Marietta's question. I mean, she encourages organizers uh, to kind of prepare a list of names and websites and everything that uh, well, where, where the organizations and associations can be found. Okay, we will not promise that, but maybe what, what you, do you suggest to somebody where to, you know, start the searching, you know, of, of this, where to go first? Well, initially, we'd actually prepared a short list of, of web links, website links, so that maybe we could add to the to the chat, but we we were afraid of losing the connection when we did, if we did that. Um, well, the, the the main organizations are in the audiovisual sector are AVTE, Audiovisual Translators Europe at the European level, which is a federation. For literary translators, it's CEATL. It's the Council, the European Council of um, Literary Translators Association. Uh, CEATL is actually the French acronym. Um, and fit. And FIT, uh, Fédération Internationale des Traducteurs, the International Federation of Translators, FIT. Um, with with these three, you'll get uh, some information. And uh, you can contact us. Uh, the, each of our, our organization has a, a contact email, and it's very easy to get in touch with us. Yeah, and FIT uh, has a... Uh... Fit Europe as a, just for Europe because it's a, the global uh, federation and uh, so they have a section for Europe. Yeah. Great, and I thank uh, Petra to to be so kind to actually back up your words with the uh, sharing of these links. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. great! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Petra. <laughs> I will take the last question from the chat. Have you encountered any vari variance in respect of language combinations? like major languages versus languages of minor diffusion in terms of um, in terms of the the protection of authors rights or maybe the or whether the, whether the people fees. are in a better situation mm. possibly uh, uh well i think uh i think if if 
if the language is scarce, uh, then you don't have so many people. So maybe they are in a better position. Yeah. Uh, I come from from a small small language country. On the other hand, there's not so much work uh, <clears throat> for some of the languages, maybe, or at least uh, this is uh, the information I get uh, from my colleagues. So. I don't know. I don't know. There's, of course, uh, English is lingua franca now, so mm -hmm. most work there. But uh, yes, it might be interesting. Uh, there are some languages that are uh, scarce and rare, and maybe people are in slightly better position there. But uh, the question is whether they have enough work if they, if if it is a rare language. Mm -hmm. I yes. think. Okay. Thank you. So I will wrap it up and I will actually share with you some like kudos to you, like like uh, everyone is apparently happy. I mean, like the ones who share their uh, opinion and chat, <laughs> they are they're, uh, thanking you since you're, you, you, you say you're not able to see small print. So yeah, everyone uh, is thanking you. So I'm, I'm going to also join these, these thanks, uh, Mirka and uh, Jean-Francois. Thank you from my side and I thank every participant here for your time and uh, also your contribution to this session. Yeah, so do we. We thank everyone who was thank willing you. to listen to yes. us at this late time of the day. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Mate, uh, for helping us yes. with this. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> thank you okay. and good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Goodbye.